uh, in our second week in a series called um, God's Blueprint for His House. God's Blueprint for His House or God's Blueprint for His, his Family. And uh, we're looking at 1 Timothy, and 1 Timothy is, an, is a, a pastoral epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote to his spiritual son, Timothy, instructing Timothy how the church is to conduct themselves in God's house. Uh, how, how, the, how the household of faith is to live together in a healthy, gospel-centered community. You see, Paul was a gospel-centered preacher. And Christianity, at the heart of Christianity, it is, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is all about Jesus Christ and his work, his finished work, and what he's done on our behalf. And there are numerous implications that the gospel of Jesus Christ has for our lives, for our relationships, our relationship with God, how we view God, how we view ourselves, how we view and treat one another. The gospel has transforming, life-changing effects on those who hear it and believe it and apply it to their lives. And here at City Church, we, we say this often, we are a gospel-centered church. We are committed to making the gospel central because that's what the scriptures do. They point us to Jesus, who he is and what he's done on our behalf. We say we, we are here to know Jesus Love people and impact your world. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, in verse 12 through 17, we get a little snippet of the Apostle Paul's testimony, which he shared a couple different times in the New Testament. We get a couple of snapshots of how God displayed his saving grace and mercy in rescuing this, un this man who was violent, who was a persecutor, who was a terrorist, and if he can do it for this guy, Saul, who became Paul, then he can do it for anybody. He can break through the hardest of hearts. Think about the person. Think about the person that you know in your life that's the most hardened towards the gospel, most hardened towards God. The, the person that, that you might be tempted to write off and think, man, they'll never become a Christian. Just think about that for a moment. And think about that in light of the power of the gospel to save. In light of the power of the gospel to save a man like Saul and, and even your, your own life. Think about the moment when you became a Christian. When your eyes were open, you were blinded, you couldn't see, you couldn't understand, you didn't know God in a saving way, in an intimate, accurate way. You didn't know his son in a saving way. And then you experienced salvation. When you heard the gospel, you believed the gospel, you responded, and God opened your eyes. He caused you to be born again. Am I, am I a little hot here? Yeah. Um, could you, could, can somebody help me turn it down just a little bit? Uh, just, just thank you. you got to sound there right there. Thank you. So first, first Timothy chapter 1, go ahead and turn there with me, uh, verse 12. Father, as we open up the pages of Scripture, as we see your evidence of grace in the life of the Apostle Paul, and as we reflect on how that message of the gospel has intersected with our lives and changed our lives, God, would you humble us? Would you undo us of pride and arrogance and self-reliance, God? And would you stir in us, God, a gospel gratitude? Would you stir in us a gospel confidence? God, would you free us up, God, to live as your sons and daughters in your liberty and your joy and your peace, walking in righteousness and holiness for the glory of your name. Lord, destroy strongholds today. Destroy the works of the devil today. Right here in the life's presence and those who whom we know and love and walk with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Paul said, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, 
appointing me to this service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. <clears throat> And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason. That in me... As the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you that by them you may wage good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is God's word. Amen. 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 Here's our big idea today. The gospel transformed <laughs> Paul's life, and he came to believe it, and he preached it. And he overflowed with gratitude for the mercy and grace that he found in it. He sought to defend the gospel message, instructing Timothy also to fight for it. The gospel transformed the apostle Paul's life, and he came that he came to believe it, and he came to preach it. As the Apostle Paul uh, previously made reference to the gospel and, and, and a lifestyle that the law exposes as sin in, in, in verses 9, 10, and 11, and, and, and exposes a lifestyle that's not in accordance to the gospel of the glory of God, the blessed God. Paul speaks about the gospel and he says, of, of which I've been entrusted, I've been entrusted with this message. And he's writing to Timothy, his spiritual son, reminding him that he too has been entrusted with this gospel message and that he must guard it, he must protect and defend it from false teaching and false teachers. And as Paul mentions the gospel, he, he, he does this in, in, in other places as well. He, he tends to break out in praise or thanksgiving. He breaks out, he, he, he expresses gratitude for what God has done. Let's look at his example. First of all, we see Paul's example that displays God's mercy and grace. God's mercy and grace. He says, though I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love, which that are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. When we speak about salvation, when Paul writes about salvation, it's connected to and because of ultimately God's mercy and God's grace. And Paul gives his testimony as he does here and in other places, and he his pattern is to share about how he was before he came to Christ, before salvation, and, and how he was after salvation. Actually, in the book of Acts, he, he shares before he came to Christ, how he came to Christ, and how he lived after that. What difference did the gospel of Jesus Christ make in his life? He was a religious man. He knew the scriptures. He, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was devoted, and he thought that he was serving God by having, kill, having Christians killed. By chasing after them, having them thrown in prison. But he received mercy. He received grace. And in this passage here, he mentions that he acted ignorantly. He, he, his eyes were spiritually blinded, as is every unbeliever. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers, lest they should believe the gospel. Jesus, when he was on the cross and was, was being killed, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
the Apostle Paul was ignorantly persecuting the church. He was an intelligent man. He was an intelligent man. And even the most intelligent people and the most devout people can be very ignorant of some of the most important truths in the universe, namely the gospel. And so we see him experiencing God's mercy and grace, and his life is a display of it. It's been said that mercy is, is not receiving what you deserve, which is what, what's the wages of sin? Death. Grace is described as receiving what you don't deserve. Pardon, forgiveness, acceptance, reconciliation, redemption, eternal life. A new identity. There's, there's these riches of grace that the Apostle Paul wrote about in, first, first, uh, in, in Ephesians 1. That God has lavished upon us. Paul was a, a trophy of God's grace. Exhibit A of God's grace and mercy that changed this, this, this terrorist and made him a preacher of truth. The very faith that he once tried to persecute, tried to destroy, he, he came to believe and came to be a preacher of. In verse 16, he says, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect Patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. That's you and me. That's you and me. So what Paul is saying here is that God chose to show him mercy and grace and be patient with him, though he was aggressively trying to destroy the faith and having Christians killed. God showed patience, mercy, and grace to him so that it, his life would be an example to us today who believe and who, who have experienced eternal life. Where our lives are impacted, there is a ripple effect that the gospel has in, in the lives of people. And, and, and Paul was called to be an apostle, to represent the Lord and to, to carry authority to represent the Lord in an apostolic kind of way where he, he wrote scripture. And he shared his testimony and how the gospel changed his life. Um, here's a couple of other verses that we can look in the New Testament and, and discover Paul's experience here. And, and uh, Galatians 1.13, he says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Uh, Acts chapter 8, but Saul, his name, before he, he became the Apostle Paul, his name was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And it says, but Saul was ravaging the church, entering house to house, house after house, and he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Sounds like a terrorist here. This guy's this guy's aggressive. This guy wants to see Christians killed. Chapter 9 of Acts. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogue at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, okay, that's, re, that's what they called Christianity back then, the way. Not a way, the way. The way with a capital W here. Men and women that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was persecuting the people of the way. Acts 22, and sharing his testimony, he said, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear with me witness. For I received the letters to brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them bound in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. So we see Paul on the way to Damascus. And if you know the story of the book of Acts, as he was on his way to continue his persecution, he encounters the resurrected Christ. And Jesus knocks him off of his horse. Jesus, Jesus uh, uh, intervenes and he, he, he says, Saul, 
Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice that language that he says. Why are you persecuting me? Who was Saul persecuting? Ultimately, Jesus, but Luke says he was persecuting the church, people of the way, his own testimony. I persecuted people of the way. But Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Now, here's something to take note of that. The, the way we treat God's church ultimately is, 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 is how we're treating him. So, so be careful how you talk about and treat one another in the body of Christ. Right? We are the body of Christ. And so Jesus took that personal, that he was killing his followers, that Saul was killing his followers. And, 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 and Paul's like, who are you, Lord? Who are? He didn't know. He was ignorant. His eyes were blinded until Jesus showed up and he broke through the, and removed the veil and opened his blind eyes, softened his hardened heart. And so Paul shares his, his testimony in here for, for at least three reasons that uh, commentator Philip uh, Towner says. He says, first of all, to authenticate his position as an apostle. You see, Paul was writing with apostolic authority, and there were false teachers and false teaching in the church. And he often did this, and even, even in this letter, he, he said at the very beginning, a, a, an apostle by the command of God. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. This was God's doing, God's idea. He didn't just conjure up this idea. That, oh, I want to be an apostle one day. God had called him to this specific role to represent Jesus in this way. And so he, he the, the gospel that he came to believe and had life changing experience from. He want he, he wanted to share his testimony to to to, to authenticate. To give witness to this gospel that he was proclaiming and his role as an apostle. Also, he says uh, he offers his experience of salvation as proof of the gospel he preaches. And he, his story establishes the priority of faith in salvation. He mentions how the grace of God towards him overflowed and, and, and he had faith and love. You see, it's by grace through faith that we're saved. I was talking, playing pickleball with my family the other night and had a uh, intense conversation with a group of Mormons that came to play and they wanted to share their faith. And so me and my family were engaging in conversations with these Mormons and I was appealing to them from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, from the gospel truth that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And this is one of the errors, one of the, the, the heretical, the, the, the places that Mormons have, have erred and strayed from the gospel centrality, <coughs> the reality that we're saved by grace through faith, not, not grace and works, right? It's, it's grace. We believe the grace that we believe in Jesus and what's been done for us on our behalf. We don't work our way up to heaven by being a nice good person doing two years of being a missionary and, and, and abstaining from caffeine and a number of other things that we can do to try to be godly externally or even internally. We need the righteousness of Jesus Christ that comes by faith. We're saved by, by grace through faith. And so we must, be, we must be diligent to defend this gospel truth, to believe it ourselves, apply it ourselves to our lives. And, and call others to believe it as well, lest they perish. And so I had, I had a, I had a um, courageous conversation with these guys. And there were others around and people were listening in. And there was, a, there was a, two other believers there that were engaging them. And they, they knew their stuff. And, they, and, and out of love and concern for these guys' soul, my concern about where they're going to spend eternity, I said, I'm concerned about you. I think you believed in the gospel. Not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so any, anyhow, um, so, so Paul also, uh, Gordon Fee says this about why he shares his testimony or, or uh, commenting on, on the, the importance of Paul inserting his story here. Paul's authority finally lies in the authentic nature of the gospel as he both preached and experienced it. Paul was living 
proof of the saving grace of God that he didn't merit his salvation. That he didn't, that he didn't um, earn anything from God in this. Now, you may, you may have some questions about this phrase here. He says, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Now, first of all, let me just highlight this. That doesn't, Paul's not saying that, that he was innocent of the things that he did. And, it's, and it's, it wasn't saying that he was innocent of the things that he did. And it wasn't saying that he earned mercy and grace from God or salvation from God. He makes that very clear in other places. Uh, Philip Towner says this, that presumably by pleading ignorance, Paul means to place his pre-conversion errors in the Torah category, that's the Old Testament law, of sins done unintentionally or unconsciously. And the language here corresponds closely to Leviticus 22. In unbelief <coughs> identifies the sphere before coming to faith in Christ in which Paul did these things. By pleading ignorance does not lessen the degree of guilt. It merely categorizes it and qualifies it, uh, those who are guilty, in the sense of God's forgiveness. Paul is saying that he sinned as an unbeliever. Is that helpful? Here's another quote that I found helpful. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, Jesus recognized this principle when he prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Their ignorance did not save them. Nor did Christ's prayer save them, but the combination of the two postponed God's judgment, giving them an opportunity to be saved. Amen. And we see Jesus also on the cross living out what he, practicing what he preached. Father, forgive them what they do. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Bless those who curse you. Pleaded for mercy and grace. Nevertheless, they were, those who killed Jesus were still guilty of the sin of, of killing the Son of God. <coughs> Paul makes it clear in other places, like 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1, verse 9, that salvation is because of God's grace and mercy. It's according to God's purpose. He says, He has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Wow, like let that sink in. Like Ephesians 1, if God chooses his people and he chooses to set his love upon us and to rescue us way even before we're born, before we make any decisions, whether good or evil, it testifies and points that to the, the reality that salvation is by grace, not by what we do. It's by grace. It comes through faith. He says in another pastoral epistle, Titus, he says, But when the goodness and the loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us not because of our works done, done by us in, right, in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly in Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of of eternal life. Amen. These are gospel truths that we must diligently defend and cling to. And not everybody who professes Christianity is believing these things. Okay? Not everybody who's professing Christianity are believing these things. I was uh, flying back from, from a school intensive this week, and um, on the airplane there was a there was a team of professional athlete a professional soccer team. And I got to sit by one of these young men, and I started talking to him about his faith. And I asked him about where he's at with the Lord, and, and if you know if he were to die, where where would he go? And he felt like he would go to heaven. You know, his mom's Christian, but you know he didn't really go to church. But and I, so then I kind of probed a little bit and said, well, why? What? Why do you think you'll make it? And he basically just shared about him being a good person. Like I haven't really done any bad things. And. He's a young guy, and he seems like a very nice guy, and I'm, I, I can imagine he's lived a pretty good life, right? But not good enough to earn salvation. There's no one that can earn salvation by the things that we do. And so the gospel, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died in our place. He died for sinners. 
And if we can't see ourselves in that category, then we're not going to see ourselves in the category of, be, of, of needing him to rescue us from our sins. Does that make sense? Yeah. We talk a lot about this here. I know this is very basic, and Paul gives, gives, gives the basics here. Uh, so the other thing that I want to highlight from this, this section here is that Paul exalts. He exalts the Lord. He praises God for his saving grace in his life. Just like in Ephesians 1, to the praise of his glorious grace. This should be the result of those who experience salvation. We should be the most thankful, praise-filled, joyful worshipers of God because we were headed for eternal destruction and Jesus Christ reached in and rescued us. Delivered us from darkness, delivered us from the power of Satan, from the kingdom of darkness, and transferred us in the kingdom of his beloved son. So Paul says, I thank him who's given me strength or enabled me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to this service. He just said in verse 11 that the Lord had entrusted him with the gospel. That's the idea there. Paul was entrusted with the gospel. <coughs> Timothy was entrusted with the gospel. Verse 14, the grace of our Lord overflowed to towards me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Notice, by the way, the, the theologians highlight the, the effect of grace. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 17, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Gospel-centered Christians <coughs> are prayerful and, and, and pr filled with gratitude and praise. Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 4.15, he said, All things are for your sake, that grace, having spread to the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Amen. Experiencing the saving grace of the gospel leads to gratitude, increasing, abounding gratitude to God. When was the last time you were in tears and gratitude, tears of gratitude before God for saving you? For some of us, it may, may have been this morning as we were singing that song, Thank You, Jesus, for the blood applied. That was me this morning. In tears, just grateful that God reached in at the right time and broke through the, 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 the power of sin in my life and set me free. He exalts, he gives praise, he uh, acknowledges that, that faith and love resulted from the overflowing grace towards him. Grace, experiencing God's grace leads to us giving him glory and honor that he is due. And so we see that, that Paul was an example, a display, an exhibit of the grace and the mercy of God. And we see that he exalted in the Lord, that he praised God, he thanked God unashamedly. He directed his praise towards God and he praised God to others, telling of others of his salvation from day to day. Psalm 96 says, and then we see, I love this little snippet right here, right in the midst of this. Paul shares his testimony, he shares a little bit about his story and how he came to faith. And right in the midst of it, he gives a, a gospel snippet. He says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Or this, I think some translations say the chief, who I am the chief, the chief of sinners. Paul, before he became a Christian, certainly was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, according to his own testimony. Okay? And, and, and so he says, he's, he explains the gospel here and he wraps up his testimony, connects his testimony with the gospel and how it intersected and changed his life. He says, this is a trustworthy saying. It's full, it's full, it's deserving, full of acceptance. In this little statement, we see the incarnation. Jesus came into this world. He took on flesh and he dwelt among us. 
in this little statement here, we see redemption. Jesus came into this world to save sinners like, like you and me. And we see his admission, his admission and his response to, to the grace of the gospel. He, he admits, I'm the foremost of sinners. I need that salvation. I need it. He went around preaching not on a high horse telling everybody how terrible they were. And, and acting as if he wasn't a sinner himself. He realized he needed the grace of God just as much as every other sinner out there. And I think healthy Christians have the same mentality. <coughs> healthy Christians are humbled by the grace of God. They're humbled by, by their own failures and sins as well. No matter how long you've been walking with the Lord. My observation is that godly men and women who've been walking with the Lord for a while, walking close with the Lord... They're a little more aware of their weaknesses and their sins and failures. They're a little more in touch with the reality of their own tendency to be selfish or proud. And not um, that tendency towards sin, but being prone to wander. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Here's my heart. Take it, seal it. It was John Newton, the, the author of Amazing Grace, at the end of his life, and, and just said, I, I, you know, I'm getting old. My memories, you know, um, you know, it's starting to fade a little bit. But I know two things. I'm a great sinner, and I have a great Savior. If you know anything about his story, he was a former slave trader. Former slave trader who came to Christ. He got converted, and he experienced the amazing grace of God. And he wrote that one of the most... <laughs> Famous, beloved hymns. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Now you may be here today and you don't have a testimony <coughs> like Paul. Like you weren't way out there killing Christians or using drugs. Or you haven't been to prison. You haven't stolen cars. You haven't done all these terrible things. You may feel like, I, I've had a pretty good life. Well, you need the grace of God and the mercy of God just as much as anybody else. The rich young ruler needed to see that. And Jesus called him on it. He challenged him with the reality of his, his need. And uh, my wife, those, those words from Amazing Grace, the Lord used in my wife's life, who my wife has came to the Lord at a young age and was walking with the Lord at a young age and the Lord kept her from so much, so much of the stuff that, that I walked in as a teenager before I came to Christ and, and she, you know, she was thinking about her own story and how the Lord rescued her and, and sometimes we can compare, compare testimonies you know, with others, they're like, oh I don't really have a testimony, like so and so and and uh, the Lord used that little phrase in my wife's life that that, that the ma amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The Lord highlighted, like, Kimmy, you're, you're a wretch. Just as much as the other sinners out there, you need grace and mercy too. And I've given that to you. Now, I don't call my wife a wretch. <laughs> I use much sweeter terms for the sake of our, our, our marriage. But we're realistic about the reality of our tendency to sin relationally. To say things, to do things, to, to be a jerk. You know, we're, 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 we're aware that we need mercy and grace and that should humble us and that should help us be patient with others. I mean, Paul's put it like this. He said in Colossians 3.13, he said that, that if anyone has a complaint against one another, you must forgive and forbear. You must forbear with them, be patient with them, and, and forgive even as the Lord has forgiven you. That's what gospel-centered relationships look like. That's what a gospel-centered marriage <clears throat> looks like. Is There's patience and there's forgiveness. There's grace. We treat one another better than we deserve. Just like the Lord has treated us way better than we deserve. I mean, that's what grace is. It's undeserved favor, blessing. And Jesus was and is full of it. That is grace. He's full of grace and truth. 
And when we experience him and know him deeply, intimately, and accurately, our lives are going to be conduits of that grace and truth. We're going to encourage others. We're going to speak the truth, too. We're going to have to say hard things because we're sinners. And we fail. We get it wrong. We will have to say hard things. But, but grace should mark our lives as believers and those who are God-centered. Let me go to my, my next point here. Paul's exhortation. Uh, to fight the good fight. In this last little section, Paul charges Timothy, and he says this. Because there were false teachers and false teaching in the church, and he had to address them, he said, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Of whom, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so here Paul is exhorting Timothy to defend the gospel or fight the good fight of faith. <coughs> there were people within the, the church of Ephesus, and he calls out specific names. Specific names. He's specific here. He doesn't just say there's some out there. Now he mentions the some and or earlier and in other places, but here he's very specific. Here's two examples. Two people who have rejected a, having a clear conscience before God, and it has led to the shipwreck of their faith. And this is a dangerous place to be for anybody. And so he, he exhorts him to fight a good fight of faith, to, to hold faith in a good conscience. He mentions this in chapter chapter 1. Uh, verse 5, he says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. He said in, in, in 1 Timothy 3, 9, when he's talking about the descriptions and the qualifications for deacons, he says that deacons are to hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Keeping a clear conscience is an, is an important part of being a healthy Christian, a gospel-centered Christian. Cultivating a clear conscience. I said it last week that our conscience is like a smoke alarm, right? Your smoke alarm goes off when you're if you're cooking something and there's too much smoke, it's gonna go off. And what's the tendency that we have to do when it's going off and it's bothering us? Take the battery out. Stop it, right? Okay, that's okay if you're just gonna do it for right there and you air out the house, put that battery back in because you're gonna go to sleep at night. And it's there to warn you when you don't know there's a fire. It's there to warn you there's danger. And your conscience functions like that. It's, it's to protect us. It's to help us have this internal <coughs> guide of, of like, you violated God's way here. And so John Calvin, the theologian, said this, that a bad conscience is the mother of all heresies. So what he, what he means there is that when, when people live with a bad conscience... It makes them vulnerable to believing and accepting false teaching. It makes them vulnerable to think, oh, well, maybe God doesn't really care if I sleep with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. Maybe God's not, maybe he's okay with men and men and women and women being married. Things like that. Where people's conscience, they, they, they violate God's standard of righteousness internally, and it opens them up to making compromise. Lord, keep us from this. John Stott says this. He says that regarding false teaching, he says it's a deviation from, the, from revealed truth. It's, it's damaging results are that it replaces faith with speculation, love with dissension, its fundamental cause is the rejection of a good conscience before God. And so these guys that he mentions here experience shipwrecked faith. Doesn't sound like anything we want for anybody who's in the church. Right? He says they, they rejected this. That's faith and a good conscience. Some have made shipwreck of their faith or they rejected a good, a good conscience. I added that. Um, in the parentheses there. 
John Piper says this about this section. He says, The shipwrecked faith is a person who makes a beginning in the Christian life, but who drifts away as their heart increasingly prefers sin over Christ. It is a heart preference issue. The heart falls in love with riches, or the heart falls in love with this present world and its approval, and so it rejects a good conscience and becomes defiled by the world's sin. Basically, a shipwrecked faith. A, basically, a shipwrecked faith is the heart's desires corrupted. And so Paul says that he handed those, these guys over to Satan, Hymenaeus and Alexander. <laughs> that doesn't sound like anything good, does it? Not for them. Well, well may, maybe that was the best thing for them. It's not something we want. We don't want to be in that place where that has to happen. But, but it's, it's, it's th th this idea of having shipwrecked faith, though it's, it's not good and it, it, it points to going in a very dangerous direction, it doesn't have to be the final destination for somebody who experiences a shipwrecked faith. Paul was shipwrecked. <coughs> Three times we're told about in the fourth time in, in Acts 27. Did he live through it? He was in, in the water for a day and a half. It was dangerous. He made it through, right? And so there's still hope. If there's somebody that you know that has fallen in this place, maybe they started off in the Christian walk. We don't know for sure if they're a genuine Christian or not. <coughs> if they are, perhaps they'll return. They'll believe again. Don't lose hope. Pray for them. Ultimately, we don't know. God knows. God knows their hearts. Paul... In 1 Corinthians 15, he uses this term being delivered over Satan to another person in the Corinthian church. And he says this, you are to, to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, let me just give a little context here just so that you're like, man, that's Paul's rough. But what about the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13? Let's go there. Same book, by the way. Paul's talking about church discipline in 1 Corinthians 5. And, and this, this guy, there was, some, there, was some, there was some immorality, some really bad stuff that he was walking in, and the church knew about it. And, and, and so Paul's like, man, this action needs to happen here. That You can't just tolerate this ungodly lifestyle. That was the most loving thing to do in that situation. 1 Corinthians 13. He's not, in, he's not contrary to what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 13 about love being patient and believing the best and all those things. This was, this was ultimately church discipline in this, this situation. Ultimately, is so that the person would repent and be restored and experience God's mercy and grace. But if they're on that path and they've experienced shipwreck of faith, they've strayed from the Lord, they've rejected God's standards for morality and godly living, and they're on that path, they're in a dangerous place. Their life is not confirming that they're a Christian by their actions. And that's a dangerous place to be. Because our lives should bear the, the evidence that we have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 9 says that whoever is born of God does not keep on practicing sin. For he cannot. So God delivers us from the power of sin. He delivers us from the penalty of sin. By, by taking on the punishment we deserve and Jesus died in our place. Christ in your place and my place. We were condemned to death and eternal separation from God and hell. And Christ took our place. And then he delivers us from the power of sin. We don't have to continue practicing the same old things that we used to do before we knew Jesus. We can walk in freedom. We've been forgiven. And one day he will deliver us from the very presence of sin. And we long for that day, don't we? Where righteousness fills the earth, and fills the lives of all who dwell in it. Where there's peace, where there's no more corruption. Sin is a vandalism of shalom, of peace. It, it, it distorts and corrupts God's good creation. And so let me close in a couple points of application here. First and foremost, marvel at God's mercy and grace in Christ. By reflecting on your own story, we've reflected on Paul's, 
Reflect on that, but also reflect on your own story of salvation and give praise to God for it. Have you experienced a story like this? Have you experienced the, the gospel uh, change your life, change your heart? If any man or woman be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is past. Behold, all things are new. So reflect on the gospel, God's grace and mercy displayed, God's love displayed while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Reflect on that and marvel at it. Also, write out your testimony. <clears throat> How many of you have written out your story of salvation before? You, on a piece of paper or type it. You can type it, write it, a note on your phone. Raise your hand. I want to know how many of y'all have written out your story. Okay? That's about half. Okay, how many of y'all have shared your story publicly if you've written it out? Okay? It's about half. Okay. I want to encourage you to do that. Write out. It'll, it'll be good for you. Trust me. It'll be encouraging for you. Trust me. Write out. What has God done in your life to bring rescue and, and, and why did he save you? As we looked at, according to his own purpose, his grace, his mercy. Paul said to be an example, to display God's patience for others. Okay? If he has saved you, he, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yeah. If you're, if you're a saved and you're rescued, you've been <clears throat> delivered from eternal destruction, then tell somebody else so that they don't have to experience eternal separation from God. Let, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And you know what? We've done this here. Uh, we, we, once you write it out, we, and we'll help you. Jacob and I, Steve and I will help you uh, write it. You know, just three, three basic elements there in writing out your story. Before you came to Christ, how you came to Christ, and so what now? What's going on? What's different now in your life since you become a Christian? That's Paul's model in, in Acts 22 and 26. Before he came to Christ, how he came to Christ, and so what now? Write it out. We'll, we'll help you if you need help. We can get it written on paper. And then we want to have you come share that on a Sunday morning right here to encourage the people of God. And take five minutes to just share it with others. And then go share it with somebody that you work with or somebody in your community. And when you share your testimony, wrap it up in the gospel. Don't make yourself the hero of the story. Okay? Paul makes Jesus the hero of the story, or he recognizes Jesus as the hero of the story. He says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And God's grace towards me was not in vain. But I labored more and more than the rest of the apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul recognizes it's God's grace that saved him. It's God's grace that empowered him to be who he called him to be and to do what he's called him to do. So write out your story. You, saints, are exhibits of God's mercy and grace. <coughs> you are exhibits of God's mercy and grace. And people need to hear, people you know and work with, family, people you know in relationship, need to hear your story. More than They, they don't just need to see kindness and joy and patience. That, that's important. Mm. But you, you, you have that care, the fruit of the Spirit, and you're walking with Jesus, and you couple that with the good news of, like, the why behind, the why behind you're different. That's a powerful witness. <coughs> the content of the gospel and the, and the witness of the gospel with your life. Okay, three, three more, and I'm, I'm closing here. I think I've gone, our clock is not working again. I did it ignorantly, not knowing. What time is it? 11.27. Okay, oh, we got 10 minutes, we're good. <laughs> Be confident that God can save and rescue the worst of sinners. So don't lose heart in prayer for them or in sharing the good news with them. If God can save Paul, Saul, who was a terrorist, he can save that, that rough neighbor that that really needs Jesus, that you know needs Jesus, or that rough co-worker mm -hmm. who seems far away from God, or family member. Family members can be the toughest, right, to, to, to reach. You know, it's just different with family. There's a familiarity there that can make, make it a little bit more difficult to uh, to share. Like, but, but it, well, well, sometimes it may help because they, they knew who you were before, and they see after, and like, we know something for real has happened. But still, there's a familiarity there that can that can put the guard up. 
and, and make it more difficult. You know, even Jesus had, had some of that pushback from his own brothers, his own family. Uh, John chapter 7. Remember this, as you're witnessing to unbelievers, remember they're blinded. Remember they're blinded. That will help us be more patient with them. I mean, who's going to chew out a blind man because he cut, cut us off, got in front of us? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm walking right here, bro. We're not going to do that. We're going to be patient with someone. We know there's a disability there. There's going to be a little more grace. And so we need to keep that in mind. They're blinded. Satan has blinded their minds. Sin has deceived them. They need salvation. They need rescue just like you and I needed it and experienced it in Christ Jesus. Their minds are darkened, Paul says. And lastly, in light of this passage, let us resolve to keep a clear conscience before God and others by being transparent and honest with God and others. The Bible calls this walking in the light. 1 John 1, 9, 1, 7, 1, 7 through 9. It says, let us walk in the light. And before that, it says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I love, I love how 1 John says God's light and he's love. Right? God is light and he's love. And he says, walk in the light, walk in love. And walking in love, according to John, is walking in honesty and truth and transparency and holiness. And so we walk in the light because we're not perfect, because we're, we still <laughs> sin. Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And so we, we, we walk in the light. It says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us of all sin. If we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins... <laughs> He's faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I like to say that God forgives sins and not excuses. And we, when we can call sin for what it is and quit trying to blame shift and hide behind other words or, or put on our own righteousness or, 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 or avoid the <laughs> guilt or avoid the responsibility of the things that we've said We've thought and we've done that have dishonored God and that have hurt others. We call that sin. Call it what it is so we can experience the benefits of the gospel, the application of the cleansing that comes to us so that we can have unhindered communion with the Lord and, and healthy relationships with others. And so if you all would pray with me, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and lead us. And a song as we, we pray here for a moment. I'm going to read from the end of Psalm, 19, Psalm 19, 